Success Insight shares the stories of the people with passion and drive who make things happen in the world. Here's your host, Howard Fox. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Success Insight podcast. Our guest today is Nick Braccia. Nick is a Keynes Lion and Clio winning writer, director, and producer. He has had a hand in developing some of the most influential viewing experiences on TV, including shows like The Outcast, Sense8, Watchmen, The Man in High Castle, Westworld, and The Purge. Now, Nick is the author of Off the Back of the Truck, unofficial contraband for the Sopranos fan. How about that? Off the Back of the Truck immerses fans further into the world of Tony Soprano, offering an in-depth analysis by Nick and his consiglieres. I hope I got that right. <laughs> and as the must-have but didn't know you needed companion guide to the award-winning television series, The Sopranos, and is a necessary prelude to the upcoming prequel, The Many Saints of Newark. Nick, such a pleasure to have you on the Success Insight podcast. Thanks for having me on, Howard. Really thrilled to be here. I have to admit, in the spirit of full disclosure, uh -huh. when The Sopranos was on TV or on HBO, I did not subscribe to HBO. So everything that I know about The Sopranos came from almost after the show was over. Mm -hmm. And in the days of COVID that we're in right now, we spend a lot of times, or I spend perhaps more time than I should, watching YouTube videos, which, and many of those YouTube videos are select scenes from The Sopranos. Oh, yeah, I do the same thing. Yeah, and as I was introduced to you and to your work, and, and I have been reading the book, I have learned so much more about what goes into producing a television show and, and a blockbuster genre defining television show than I ever realized. And so I would love, as we start to get into our conversation today, really kind of understand what lent you to want to write this book about The Sopranos and what is it about your background that kind of helped to inform this wonderful book off the back of the truck? I think Paul McCartney is saying it's a long and winding road. That's what took me to this book. I've had a creative marketing career for over two decades. And part of, I think, what's made me somewhat successful there is that I'm always pulling from other aspects of my life and always, to use kind of an archaic term, moonlighting in different fields, pursuing different interests, and working to build bridges between those and my quote-unquote day job. And through that kind of approach, I often feels like stumble upon some pretty incredible opportunities. So it's it's almost like my, my loose philosophy and the way that I have approached things, whether purposeful or not, has turned into something of an ethos. I stay busy and these things find me where I'm able to apply my skills and interests and take chances. To get specific, the real focus here and what led to the Sopranos book off the back of a truck is I grew up in the tri-state area and there's lots of tri-state areas. I know nationally, the one I'm talking about is New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut, where there's a lot of similarities, both in terms of immigrant cultures, in terms of the way that class breaks down everything. If you put a big dot on Manhattan and go 45 to 75 minutes out in any direction, there's sure there's specific Connecticut culture, Jersey culture, Long Island culture, Rockland County culture, all that stuff. But there's also a connective tissue and through line. So that that's the world I grew up on. And the show came out just it's it premiered in 99. So I was one year removed from college, really just starting my adulthood. So it was resonant. And I had being an Italian American, being tri-state area, I had it was like, oh, this has my attention. With respect to film and TV. Growing up, I went to public school through eighth grade and then to a Jesuit all-boys high school followed by a, a Jesuit college called the College of the Holy Cross in Worcester, Massachusetts. There, I made lots of great friends, but also met a man who had become my mentor. He was my, my film professor starting my sophomore year. His name is Steve Weinberg. And it was, I always had loved movies and TV as a kid. Of course, the, the Lucas and Spielberg stuff but also things like Twin Peaks, you know, where I, I really started to understand what my taste was, what my aesthetic was, what my sensibility was. 
my parents are civil servants. I grew up in a loving, active sports oriented household, but it wasn't like, let's all go to the ballet. You know, we weren't, we weren't going to like Indian art house movies, but this whole new world opened up for me in college through Professor Weinberg, Steve, and, and these, these friends of mine. Uh, the short version is I learned how to read and understand cinematic filmic language how to analyze it, how to write on it, how to express myself and have conversations around that. And it, and it enriched me in the true liberal arts sense. And I've always kept those muscles and worked those muscles through relationships with friends, through keeping in touch with Steve, through writing, and through my work on understanding and working to market entertainment properties. A lot of getting called in two years before West, before HBO airs Westworld uh, with with the agency Campfire I was working for to help HBO understand how to position and sell and communicate what Westworld's about to people. That all goes back to learning and understanding the material first, be, being able to communicate tone and theme, things like that. So you develop these skills and you're not like, oh, I'm going to quit my job and write TV criticism because there's like only six people I think get to do that in the world at this point. <laughs> it's not a, it's not a, you know, a, a job, but it's funny because I used to work at Simon and Schuster, the publisher of this book in the in the late 90s. But I ended up in a happenstance conversation with a wonderful woman, Teresa DeMasi, who is the publisher of Tiller Press, this Simon and Schuster imprint. And we were brought together by a colleague and, f- and friend of mine, Sam Ford, who's working on her team. And we ended up in this remarkable conversation about the book. And I think she said offhanded at the time, oh, you, sh- you should write something like that. And I was like, oh, well, I'm not, a, I don't write books, but sure. Um, you know, was, I thought it was a foddering thing to say. And it was a great and fun conversation. But three months later, I got an email that was like, have you thought any more about that project? And I was like, yes, <laughs> even though I hadn't uh, thought, to, you know, and I went to their office within a couple of days. My day job has always been selling ideas. I went into this meeting excited by the prospect of, and like I walk into any meeting, it's like, I want to inspire wonder. I want people to feel possibility and I want to sell this idea. And I did. You know, what's interesting is off the back of the truck, this is not your typical book about a TV show. A lot of books that I had a writer on in the early days of my podcast was a writer for Cheers and Seinfeld and, you know, talk about, you know, here's the evolution of the comedy, of the writing. And, I mean, this is not a book about, okay, here's season one, here's episode one, episode two, episode three, and so on. I mean, this thing is dissected and through a lot of different lenses. How did that construction, how did that come about? Or did you just blurt it out, let's do it this way? Or... How did you kind of decide on the construction? Because that's that to me, as I'm reading this book, Nick, is really what I find fascinating. I mean, I mean, I'm all about food too. And I know you talked about Italian food. And, and by the way, I love the difference between gravy uh, and a ragu. Because uh, I used to know a guy from Philly area who talked about he's spending a weekend making gravy. And I was like, okay. <laughs> so thank you. I've been educated on that one. Uh, so how did this construction of this book come about? Maybe talk a little bit about that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so, some of it was purposeful and some of it was the kinds of happy accidents that I find occur if you're producing something and feel comfortable enough to go with the flow. Part of the conception of the book was, and also when I sold this, I'm working a full-time job and have a daughter and have a couple of podcasts. And not only that, I hadn't really written critically for an audience in a while. So I was thinking to myself, The Soprano Sessions is, is another book. It's a terrific book by New Jersey, I think Newark Star Ledger, a TV critic and a guy who's written multiple books, Alan Seppenwall, partnering with Matt Zoller Seitz, who's been writing for Vulture and Roger Ebert's site forever. They did that and I wasn't going to do it better. Like it exists. If you want an episode guide, The Soprano Sessions, where they they take all of their post episode pieces that they wrote when the show was on and put them in this great compendium and did extra stuff. That exists. So we don't need another one of those. Also, they're more famous than I am. So, so if someone's picking between mine and theirs, I'm not going to win. So it was like, what's what's my angle? And I thought, and also, how can I get this done against the deadline? As a producer, as a writer, as a DJ, a kind of radio style DJ, not rave techno DJ, I've always been good at, at uh, bringing people together and knowing how to hear a room and cast a room and put a party together. 
And I thought, and I didn't know who the invitees were going to be at first. I was like, if we can get a really diverse group of voices in this book, it's going to feel like a party for fans of the show. Also, there's lots of stuff I can write about, but there's also lots of stuff that I'm not going to be that good at writing about. Like a much, for example, I was really well uh, suited to write about the video game and pinball machine. I was less suited to write about the makeup that the character Danielle from Whippany wears. And not only that, when you cast the book as a party, then in today's social media world, all those other people are, work, are just as proud and working just as hard as me to promote the book. And they're all part of this conversation. So I just decided I'm going to foster and throw this book as a party and invite like the 10 to 12 people I'd, I'd most like to attend a real chorus of voices in there and see what happens. And in that mix, I'd say the core of it, especially for me, as I was working through the process of the book are, you know, three different people who I studied with under Steve Weinberg, Steve Weinberg himself, a guy that acted for Steve at Stanford, Joe Mader, who became my friend later. So like a third, you know, a third or so of those people are from my kind of like core group of folks who I've been talking about TV movies and art. I've been talking about, you know, for 25 years with these people, there's going to be natural chemistry and other people were ones that I've met some of them I don't know in real life. I know through Facebook and through reading their material over the years and just invited them into this party. And it ended up, I think, being pretty well cast. And it gave it, I really didn't want anyone to get sick of my voice in the book. <laughs> it was a goal. And I think I think it works pretty well at that. Yeah, you know, I, I'm curious, as you're inviting your collaborators, your consiglieries, did mm -hmm. I, am I pronouncing consig? I've heard it pronounced that way, consigliere is how they do it in, in The Godfather when they talk about Tom Hagen. Right. Tom Hagen was an wartime consigliere, they said. Okay, right. <laughs> so, so no G, no G sense. Yes, no G. Consigliere's. As you're bringing this group together, at first, as you were describing, and I'm thinking about the round tables in the turn of the last century in New York, where all these great writers are coming together and just kind of exchanging ideas. When you started to assemble this team, did you have an idea of what the topics were going to be? I mean, there's there's some obvious ones. I mean, there's again the food. You've got uh, you've got the Italian culture, American Italian culture versus, you know, I would imagine an American Italian, Italian American goes to Italy today. I mean, they're they're in two different worlds. Yeah. Okay. And there's this. There's probably the new. By the way, I did live in New Jersey for four months. Oh, what's what town? Uh, Englewood. Oh, okay. Englewood. That's, that's not too far from me. I'm just over the, I live in Manhattan on the other side of the George Washington Bridge. I know that very well. And by the way, I do miss New Jersey bagels. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> and I do prefer, well, I grew up in Detroit, so I do prefer that pizza. That's okay. But in any case, <laughs> I digress. So you're bringing this group together. How did you then apportion the topics? Because there's so many of them. There's the music, there's the clothing, the food the like say the pinballs the ga you know the gambling there's the tony was a, he's a sociopath but he you know definitely tightly he's tightly wound in some ways you yeah know. he's very relatable he's yeah. very he, he's very very human i mean the the whole show is a, is a send up of our own consumerist culture yeah and i think that we can all we can all see ourselves in those characters which is why it's so effective yeah and how did you then decide to say, let's talk about this and then bring the right collaborator together to say, okay, what, what do we need to know? What do we want to share? How did that flesh itself out? It wasn't too hard. I knew essentially, if you go back and look at the initial pitch, it was a little more bathroom book and a little less highfalutin is the wrong term, but a little, a little less evolved than it turned out to be. And it just once I started to get going and thinking about what I really wanted in it, it just turns out I'm more suited and better for the tone of the book. I knew everything about the show where I thought there was something interesting to say. And then I just started listing people who I thought would be great at it, whether I knew them or not. And some people said no or were busy. Most said yes. And I'm lucky just in being kind of a, a social for this is a, a double edged sword, a pathologically nice person, <laughs> which isn't always a great thing to be. I just, I know a lot of people and a lot of people who are multifaceted. A person whose contributions to the book, I hear people <laughs> sound way more excited about his contributions than my own, is my friend Eddie McNamara. Eddie was someone who I didn't talk to that much for about 15, 20 years. 
we studied abroad in the UK together and didn't know, you know, didn't know another met on campus, these two East Coast kids. He was from Marine Park in Brooklyn. And after we met on this UK campus and we were fans of pro wrestling and New York sports and all this stuff, we bonded these two weirdos on this British campus. And he became a Port Authority police officer and went through working search and rescue after 9-11 and then retired early and became a crime writer and a chef. So he was like, he had so many angles and his own lenses that he could bring to this book. I'm like, he's a great food writer. He's a great crime writer. He's a partner and we become renewed, reinvigorated our friendship over the course of this project and are doing more things together. And his wife, Marev Devash, who writes about fashion, who's covered makeup and fashion for years in magazines like Allure and for brands like Revlon. I just know a lot of really talented people who don't get necessarily opportunities at the level of a Simon & Schuster published book. So I was like, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to bring lots of help and they're going to be people that I like. If that, I mean, it's as, it's as simple as that. That's nice. I mean, that's what friends are for. And what has been the reaction to the book? I mean, it's just only just been released. And mm-hmm. as I shared early on, I mean, you can't go onto YouTube without seeing a 10 best killing scenes of Tony Soprano or et cetera, et cetera. What has been the reaction so far of the community that just, you know, lives and breathes everything Sopranos and just it's part of their day to day appreciation? I mean, it's early. So the the initial very positive, thankfully, reactions came from trade. Library Journal, Kirkus, Publishers Weekly, they all wrote positive reviews, which made me happy. I mean, I live in the world of, like I said, creative marketing, so I'm always getting feedback. It isn't always great. On the podcast and with other things, I always crack up when I get my first one-star review because someone's going to do it at some point. You're just like, if you want, you want to have a bunch of five and four stars before that one hits so it doesn't sting which has usually been the case for me. And that's fine. But I always kind of smile when the first one star one comes in. I haven't gotten a one star one yet for this book. It's starting to get some traction on on Sopranos Twitter and on some different sites and reviews are starting to show up on Amazon and and Goodreads. It's only been 13 days since the book came out. But the thing that uh, was the most satisfying for me so far is that A gentleman named Dan, who goes by the alias Kevin Finnerty, which is Tony Soprano's own sort of alias from a large dream sequence in season six. He was one of the creators of Sopranos Con, which I, although I haven't met him in person, I did attend two days of Sopranos Con in New Jersey last year. It was an amazing event. And I got him an early copy of the book because I wanted his perspective. And also because I wrote an essay on Sopranos Con that is, that is largely positive. I thought it was a very great event that was certainly fueled by passion. And it ended up being the last piece that I wrote before I turned the book in last November. He's been very supportive and has helped to promote it. And everyone's been into it. It's going to take some trickle down with the Facebook groups where I'm seeing a little traction there and on Reddit. But the fact of the matter is most groups of people that have gotten together online around The Sopranos, they want to show clips. They want to repeat lines. And the level of, and this isn't knocking it because I do the same friggin' thing and I like it, but the, the level of discourse that's happening online about The Sopranos isn't generally the same level of appreciation as the book. But I think that, I think over the next couple of weeks and months, we're going to get a really good trickle down effect. So, so far, I mean, short version, largely positive so far. Fantastic. Well, you know, it's interesting. Sound like a broken record. Anything that's speaks about food and culture. I'm like, I'm all in. I just love reading and immersing myself in other cultures and just the you know, the nuances between the the cooking that becomes American Italian versus, you know, authentic Italian. It's just I'm I'm all in for that. I am curious, you had mentioned early on about Twin Peaks in one of your opening statements. And I know Twin Peaks was developed by David Chase or he uh, David Lynch, David Lynch, David Lynch. Yep. I, and I know it, it was you referenced it a couple of times in, in the show, just the way mm-hmm. the photography and the scenes and the imagery was used. I, I was really curious about The Sopranos and I was reading the book. I mean, Chase was amazing and the use of the camera angles the dialogue is he just like uh, this genius i mean do people can you actually learn that in school he learned it on the job like he was i think he was well into middle aged by the time the show got picked up i believe he'd wanted a career in movies but he had worked on the rockford files for years for Kolchak the Night Stalker, which is a terrific show with, with Darren McGavin that ended up being the influence for the X-Files. A couple other shows of his own, but he was a TV journeyman 
And there weren't really, aside from like, I guess at the time, maybe David E. Kelly and Stephen Bochco and Lynch, who got that, that big shot with Twin Peaks, there wasn't peak TV yet. There weren't television auteurs the way that the X-Files would spawn guys like Vince Gilligan, who went on to do Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul, or uh, Frank Spotnitz, who went on to, uh, you know, to start Man in the High Castle with Amazon. It was a, dif- it was a different world. It was much, it was much more the world of, of the yeoman, even guys like Stephen J. Cannell who did shows like Wise Guy and the A-Team, tons and tons of crime shows. It was a real sort of like yeoman's business. It wasn't considered, it was considered very different than cinema and and certainly not as, as high, highly regarded. And I, I hesitate to use highfalutin because it sounds pejorative, but it wasn't that world. And he kind of, you know, this kind of just happened and he started it, but he had you know, diverse array of skills from wanting to get into movies and from working on like and making really smart TV for decades before this opportunity. And there's a really great essay in the book that I love by uh, my friend Phil uh, Dias Nugent, who's written about movies and TV for AV Club, uh, newspapers in New Orleans and, and, and all over, which really chronicles the evolution of David Chase's career and how you know, and how everything that kind of, that led up to uh, the Sopranos. I mean, before the Sopranos, he, he had done. Um, I think he produced the final Rockford Files movie. Towards the end of that, he worked on the latter seasons of Northern Exposure. But certainly, nobody thought like, "Oh, this is the guy who's obviously going to change TV forever." It just it just came together. I mean, in a lot of ways, the book came together that way too. Not to compare the book to the Sopranos, but you know, when you were talking about the food, you you reminded me that. Originally, I was just going to have a chapter on slang, on Italian slang, and we looked up a guy, uh, a professor from Chicago who lives out in Long Island, uh, Fred Gardefa, who, and I ended up having a drink with him, and he's such a fascinating guy who's real, his life and his study is about Italian culture on the boot and and the Italian immigrant experience. I ended up you know, it's like, why would I just talk about slang with this guy? We talked about, and there's a whole interview with he and I in the book about Italian American masculinity and the immigrant experience. And he's part of our, our long conversation about the finale. And it was just like, I reached out to this guy because I wanted, you know, because I wanted to talk about Gabagool. And I'm like, why would I talk about Gabagool when I'm sitting across from this genius who, who's, you know, who lost family members to the outfit, to the mob in Chicago and really is dedicated his life to the culture. So it's, I had no, I had no idea who he was until I was already writing the book and he ended up being a big part of it. Fantastic. And the influences of the Sopranos and what we are seeing today, I mean, is kicked off in 99. So to 2005, 2006 ish. I mean, so we've had a good 14 years beyond that now. How is the Sopranos and the work of David Chase? How, you know, just given your research now and your your conciliaries production of this book, how has the Sopranos continued to inform the type of work we're seeing today? I think that in a lot of ways, it it just opened up possibility and and risk taking and chances, and it it just it felt so premium. And then you had, so you had HBO, right? Who's always said, it's not TV, it's HBO. And then you had all these other networks playing catch up and the streamers. So they, they raised the bar a lot, pardon me, in terms of production, in terms of scope, but also in terms of ideas that on paper initially might've been, you know, were really hard to sell. Well, it's this gangster, but he's depressed and on Prozac and he goes to see a shrink. It's like, all right. All right, that sounds like analyze this. Like it's, it, and but it's obviously not. It's this huge novelistic, multi-layered, you know, complex thing. So it it also I think gave permission to creators, and we see this with uh, Sopra- Sopranos alums like uh, Matthew Weiner, who created uh, the you know who created Mad Men. He's sort of the David Chase of Mad Men after working on the Sopranos, you know, for and with David Chase to center shows around complex individuals who who they aren't they aren't just one thing you know they can be they can behave compassionately and without humanity with you know completely repugnantly and so it, it bucked convention there are people and there's always the discussion like oh 
What's with all the, we, the, the papers used to write people, you know, fans of the Sopranos have been disappointed because they want more whack and less yakking. They do because they, they assumed that the Sopranos was just a gangster show that was going to offer the kicks that the gangster movies have since the 30s, right? They didn't realize they were going to have to think or want to. They didn't want to be challenged. And the Sopranos is very is a it's I mean ultimately I think it's a comedy, but it's a it's a very challenging one. It, it really enabled creators and made an appetite and audience for the pocketbooks to open up for diverse palettes and, and multi layered complex entertainments. Very good. I've got two questions on my mind now before we kind of uh, wrap it up. Nick is the book is out, you know, you and your uh, conciliaries have, you've written this wonderful book, great stories. Perhaps Tony Soprano is the obvious one, but if you could sit down with a character in the book, have a meal, have a conversation, Mm -hmm. who would that be? Oh, wow. That's a, you know what? I haven't, that's a really good question. I haven't thought too much about it. There's so many great ones. I think that I think the person, the character that I would probably get along the best with, would be. I mean, there's others fascinating people who are extremely dangerous, and I'd want to I'd want to stay away from them. But um, Steve Buscemi's character in season five, Tony Blundetto, who plays uh, Tony Soprano's cousin, I think is a really terrific character uh, who has who has noble intentions when he gets out of prison, and it's just a, he's a very tragic character because there's all of this gravitational pull back towards the life he had decided to leave. And it, I don't want to spoil anything for people who haven't necessarily seen the show yet, but he's just, he's a very moving, very relatable character and, and a terrific actor. Um, but the show is just so, so full of, uh, of multifaceted, terrific performances, but that's, yeah, that's the one I did. see. I saw him once. I saw him once in a, in a pizza place about 20 years ago. When the Sopranos was on, and like he gave me a dirty, it was near uh, Union Square, in New York City. He gave me a dirty look, and I think he gave me a dirty look because I was talking to somebody about going tanning. And I said, <laughs> "Blah blah 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 blah, I can't do that. I got to go tanning." And I just saw Steve Buscemi look over at me like, "Seriously, dude? Like, sure, What's your- who are you?" And I didn't, and I stopped. I stopped going tanning after that. <laughs> there you go. True, true story. <laughs> okay, we'll keep, we're going to keep that in. We're going to keep that in. Uh, last question for your readers. Mm-hmm. What would you like for them to take away from this book? Great question. Um, That's two in a row, what, by the way. What may, no, it is. Really, what <laughs> makes me happy, and so, you know, a couple of people have said this to me recently, like, I, I didn't put the books so everybody could be like, Nick, you and your friends are really smart. Like, you know, th- does that feel good? Sure. But if someone can, who's, who's seen the show before, maybe once, maybe twice, and they're a fan, and they read this book, and it brings them back to the show and they can appreciate it with a new layer and they can start to discover things that even that I missed for themselves. There are things that clicked for me on my fifth or sixth viewing of, of, of an episode in my life where I was like, oh my God, that's what he was up to. And I was able to write a piece. I guarantee that a book just as long as this one with as many smart things to, that I think we've said can be written without repeating a single idea from from our book so if i can inspire people to engage the material in a way that enhances improves their lives and how they think about art and culture that's all i could ask for sounds good sounds good now are you going to be on the edge of your seat for the many saints of newark yeah i'm very very curious it was supposed to, the book was originally going to come out in august and it was ready because the movie was due in september but with this horrible year that we've had with covid the movie got pushed the book got pushed so the book came out in december the movie's coming out in march in theaters and on hbo max i'm very curious to see what they're going to do all i know i haven't read a script i haven't seen a trailer nobody has i don't even think they've released a poster but what i want everyone to remember is the irony of that title in the show livia soprano tony's mother referred to you know her deceased husband John Boy Soprano as a saint he's like my your father was a saint and you know he wasn't he he, he was horrible he, he abused people he killed people he was was you know he was not a good man like at all so when they when they say the many saints of Newark it's certainly tongue firmly in cheek deep irony and I'm convinced that we're going to see very complicated and probably poor behavior from the characters. Mm. 
Well, you know, all mothers love their children. Nothing can go wrong there. Yeah. Nick, it's been an absolute <laughs> pleasure to have you on a Success Insight podcast and just, you know, hearing this journey that, that has unfolded and sharing this wonderful work with our listeners. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me on, Howard. I hope, I hope people enjoy it and enjoy the show. I certainly hope so. <laughs> As I know, before the show starts, I've got to go back and YouTube videos aren't enough anymore. I think I need to go back and binge watch over the holidays. Nick, if our listeners would like to learn more about you and your work, uh, where are the best places for them to go? My personal site, which I need actually need to update with the books, is bracciacreative.work. That's B-R-A-C-C-I-A, creative.work. And just Nick Braccia, throw me in a search engine. The books will come, uh, This book and my other book, Video Palace, which is written under a pseudonym, uh, Maynard Wills. I edited it with a, a partner of mine. That's in, that's in kind of the, it's kind of serial meets stranger things uh, territory. So very different from, uh, from this. Uh, you can find all that stuff on Amazon and any search engine. And I'm on uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, all is Nick Braccia. Fantastic. Well, we'll definitely provide the backlinks to the website and all to your social sites as well. And cool. again, Nick, thank you so much for joining us on the Success Insight Podcast. My pleasure, Howard. Thanks for having me. All right, folks, we've just been chatting with Nick Braccia. He is the author of Off the Back of the Truck, the unofficial contraband for the Sopranos' fan. And Off the Back of the Truck immerses fans further into the world of Tony Soprano, offering an in-depth analysis by Nick and his conciliaries and is the must-have but didn't know you need a companion to the award-winning television series, The Soprano. So we hope you enjoyed today's podcast. And uh, I do believe, you know, this is, we are well over 100 podcasts this year. And I do believe this episode will be the crowning achievement on 2020 for us. So what a great way to end a very interesting year and just to be able to get another view and creativity and what how people are using their gifts to, to create some wonderful works of art. In this case, a book off the back of the truck. Folks, listen to us on successinsightpodcast.com. We're also on Facebook and LinkedIn at Success Insight Podcast. You can listen to us also on the podcast channels, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Google Podcast, Apple Podcast, and Amazon Music, Pandora, iHeartRadio, as well as on YouTube. Okay, folks, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, go out there, have a phenomenal day. Take care of yourselves, your family, practice social distancing, wear a mask, and again, have a fantastic and safe end to your year and hope you have a very healthy and happy new year 2021. I think we all deserve it by now. All right, folks, take care. And we'll see you next year on the Success Insight Podcast. Take care now. Success Insight is a production of Fox Coaching and First Story Strategies. Find us online, successinsightpodcast.com.